So I'll try this again. <clears throat> um, this book is kind of the dummy's guide to climate change. And for the purposes of this session, uh, Rajan is the guide, I'm the dummy. Um, Rajan, I actually wanted to, normally we start with the theme of the book, but I wanted to, I was curious about what was said about you during the intro. You're a tech entrepreneur uh, with quite a few years in that uh, field. And you decide to take a sabbatical and do a one-year deep dive into climate change in Harvard. Uh, firstly, that's unusual. Secondly, I was wondering, what was that epiphany? Was that was that a, was there a trigger? Was there a moment in time when you thought you needed to go deeper into this? Sure. Thanks, uh, Prem. Uh, the trigger actually happened. Uh, probably around 15 years back or even more. Uh, and I've recounted that in the book. Uh, we were having a social gathering at home with friends and family from different parts of the country and uh, some from overseas also. And while we grown-ups were having a good time, the children were creating a ruckus around. And we wanted to get rid of them at that moment and leave us grown-ups alone. So somebody came with an idea that, uh, you know, give them some sheets of paper and some colors and let them go and draw outside. And we put a price to it that, okay, come back, the best will get a price from us. And half an hour later, they're all in a line and came, came back. And what really hit me was that most of the children who were from outside of Delhi uh, drew the sky as blue, nice blue. And my kids, who had lived in Delhi most of their life, drew it as gray. And that was an awakening, because in Delhi, you don't see uh, blue skies. Uh, but it was, it was kind of, it hit me, and I started reading about it. I got concerned about the pollution in Delhi. But honestly, that's where it stayed, you know, a little bit of interest here and there, and, you know. And then, uh, uh, COVID came, and I wouldn't go into the details, that'll be boring, uh, and gave, that gave a pause to all of us, right? And fortunately, the company that I had founded uh, was in a cruise mode at that time, so I could afford to think differently. And I decided to take the sabbatical and pursue my uh, interest. Uh, one out of uh, interest, but by that stage, because you know, COVID gave time to all of us to read and you know, do what we wanted. I also felt it as a compulsion uh, to go and do something about this very vital issue, which uh, the world didn't seem to be paying too much attention to. At least the the people that I was kind of hobnobbing with didn't seem to. So that that's really what took me to Howard and I uh, kind of decided to commit my time to climate change. I'll circle back to this later, but uh, you talked about that moment when, because of the drawings that your kids did, uh, you suddenly woke up to this whole thing of what is happening to, cl to our climate in general. Uh, what strikes me is, again, it's one of the tidbits that I picked up from your book. I wasn't aware of it before. Uh, there was a Swedish scientist who had predicted global warming 1896? 1896. Yeah, and then there was, uh, from about the 1950s, we've been tracking carbon emissions. That's right. Uh, in the 2000s, you've had Al Gore bringing it to the global platform uh, with his talks, with the documentary and Inconvenient Truth. It strikes me centuries, or if you want to skip the uh, if you want to skip Keeling and, and, and the Swedish scientist whose name I forget at this point, even after Al Gore, it's what, two decades. And we still seem to be confused about what climate change is. Uh, we see Joshimat sinking, we say that's climate change when it's actually building the wrong thing in the wrong place. Uh, so there is, a, there is a knee jerk use of climate change and what that tells me is that people still haven't wrapped their 
heads around the core concept. Why is it so difficult to understand? Um, you know, climate is a complex issue. Uh, there's, of course, science in it, and there are, you know, uh, it's complex, and it's, in a traditional sense speaking, it's slow, right? The change is slow, but it doesn't remain slow forever, you know? It accelerates at a point in time. And uh, there are political issues around it, there are scientific issues, there are economic issues. Uh, it's not been brought to the uh, center stages, you know, it wasn't brought for a very long time, right? Uh, just to go on the, uh, the uh, time, this thing that you were mentioning, uh, it was first spoken about in 1896. It was in 1988 that the IPCC was formed to investigate what this whole thing is all about, right? In 1992 then, uh, the UN Treaty, UNFCC, was created, and it's now 32 years, and we still haven't done anything, right? Uh, one of the issues that I feel uh, which has been impeding it, other than the fact that, like we were talking a little while back, it's death by a thousand cuts, you know, there are too many issues which are causing climate change. We'll come to that later. But climate faces two inherent issues or problems. One is it's a collective action uh, issue or the tragedy of commons, right? If I'm emitting carbon dioxide here, uh, I'm not necessarily uh, facing the consequences of it. It could be anybody in Timbuktu or it gets averaged and you know everyone may face similar consequences. So the perpetrator and the sufferer are not the same, right? Therefore, everybody becomes a perpetrator because we think it's somebody else's issue, right? Everyone's problem is no one's problem. And that's how countries have been pointing fingers at each other, companies have been ignoring it, and we individuals also, like, you know, you can see that thing in traffic here in Bangalore, you can see it in <coughs> Delhi or the, for pollution. We think our changing will not have any consequence, let others do that. So I think that's one of the dampening factors. The other one is there is a time lag between the action you take for climate and the results you see. And it could be pretty long, right? Like India has committed to uh, creating a carbon sink or planting, I think, two billion trees or something. But imagine by the time the country thinks about it, they plan, they actually put money behind it, they acquired land, whatever else needs to be done, and then they plant trees. It'll be probably 30 years by the time those trees actually start giving you results, right? Whereas we are living in an age of instant gratification. We want things right now. And it's not only at the individual level, it's at the company's level, because most of the companies are now governed by the stock exchanges for, with quarterly results. Climate will need long-term investments, whereas they have to show results in every quarter. So the investments required uh, for climate are not going into you know, the companies, whatever you know, they need to do. Also at the government level, you know, we have elections every four or five years, politicians come and go. But the moment they come, they are looking at the next election. And rightly so, that's their profession, right? <laughs> And when they're there, they want to focus on development, on delivering growth, on showing people or giving people benefits which are today, right? Uh, you know, so that's how even in the political circles, you hear a lot of noise, but you don't see action, right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why enough attention or money is not going into climate. So. I would say these two factors um, could be the one. Actually, two, three of the points that you made, one is about the instant gratification bit, one is about the time lag. These are things that I want to get into in greater detail. But honestly, to set it up, you did make the point that climate change is complex. You made the point that climate change has many touch points. It's not a single. It's not like, say, for instance, you have COVID. 
uh, you trace it to a particular virus, you trace the virus to a point of origin, you cordon off things, you, you get, uh, let's say, an antidote for the virus or a, or a vaccine that uh, protects you from the uh, consequences of uh, infection. There is no one touch point for climate change. So again, you don't find a silver bullet. There is no single path to a solution. But before we get into that kind of detail, uh, Rajan, what I was wondering was for all of us, could you give us a crash course in climate change? How does that happen? What are the touch points? How do the things interlink? It's a, it's a, let's call it a dummy's guide to climate change. Sure. Uh, let me do two things. I'll, I'll try and paint a picture of what climate change could do to us, and then maybe explain the science behind it. Is that okay? Right? So, I'm sure all of you are aware about climate change because nature has been ringing its alarm bells every so often with heat waves, with floods, with sea ra level rise, with droughts, right? All these are being caused because of global warming, which means that the temperature, average temperature of the globe or the earth is going up. And this t extra energy, so to say, is causing havoc, right? Uh, just to give you an example, if because of this global warming or rise in temperature, we are seeing glaciers are melting, right? Uh, there will be a day if we continue the way we are, the temperature is rising, the glaciers will melt, right? Uh, if only the Antarctica and Greenland melt, the sea level will rise by around 200 feet. Now imagine most of our population is along the shores. Most of our cities, uh, I'm talking globally, are around the shores. What happens to that population, right? Uh, and it's not only at the sea uh, shores. On the other hand, because of the temperature rise, uh, we are getting arid lands. Places are becoming uninhabitable. They're turning into deserts. Now, which means that the habitable land is shrinking, right? So as a result of that, migrations will happen, right? And we know whenever migrations happen, if you look back in history, wars follow, right? That's one consequence of uh, climate change, right? And it's not only the humans who will migrate, the animals will also migrate, natural in uh, instinct, right? And what happens when the two come closer together, the proximity increases. There's a class of diseases called zoonotic diseases which transfer from animals to human beings. The incidence of those will increase, right? There are certain uh, diseases or there are certain animals called as reservoir hosts which have pathogens which haven't yet crossed over to the human beings, right? Uh, COVID is one of the examples of that could be, right? Now imagine the proximity between animals, those animals and humans increasing. So the incidence of disease will definitely increase, right? The incidence of disease will also increase because climate change is not only bringing in heat, it's also bringing in humidity, right? And heat and humidity are a deadly combination for vectors. Mosquitoes, leeches will all increase and with that, a whole host of diseases. Mental stress will increase, right? And so would accidents, and right? The other fallout of climate change would be on the food systems. Not only the, uh, you know, the arable land is reducing, but food will get destroyed or crops will get destroyed because of uh, heat, because of floods, and there'll be new pathogens which will destroy, right? So the human race is under challenge, right? Uh, we, we all need to be aware of that, right? Now, having said that, just to talk a little bit about the science behind climate change, if you really see, there's nothing new about climate change, right? 
ever since the universe was created or our planet was created, uh, the planet has been going through these cycles. It goes from a state where it's extremely warm to a state where it's extremely cold, from a state where it's all ice to a state where there's no ice, right? And these changes are governed by two phenomena. Uh, one is called the orbital cycle, and the other one is called the carbon cycle. The orbital cycle is based on the revolution of the Earth around the sun, and also the, uh, its own rotation, right? And there are three levers. The first one is called the Earth's eccentricity. The trajectory that the Earth follows around the sun changes from being a perfect circle to being an eclip uh, el el ellipse, right? And this happens every 100,000 years. This, what it does is it kind of determines the amount of sunlight or sun's energy being received by different parts of the Earth at different points in time, right? The second lever is the Earth's tilt or the axis, as you know, the Earth's axis is tilted, and it varies from 22.1 degrees centigrade to 24.6. Again, what it does is it determines the amount of sun's energy uh, reaching the North Pole. And North Pole plays a tremendous role in climate uh, because most of the landmass is in the north. When the tilt is the uh, least, uh, the Earth the summers are short in the North uh, Pole, right? And what happens as a combination of these two levers is that if, imagine if the Earth is at its farthest end from the sun and the axis is tilted to the minimum, uh, the summers are really short and not very warm. So whatever ice or snow falls during the winter time does not melt fully during summers. So over years and decades and centuries, it start, the ice starts building up and takes us into an ice age. The reverse is also true, right? When the Earth is at the closest and the tilted at, is at the other end, summers are long and hot. And over centuries, then it brings us back into a state where we are off the ice age, right? I hope that gives you an idea about the orbital cycle. Then there is the carbon cycle. Now the amount of carbon in the Earth system is fixed, right? But it keeps moving between the atmosphere, the biosphere, the geosphere, and the hydrosphere, right? For example, uh, the flora and fauna that we see die, and when they die, uh, decomposition happens, and some of the carbon gets into the ground, the rest of it gets into the atmosphere. This atmospheric carbon, uh, some of it gets absorbed by the oceans, some of it gets washed down by rain, turns into carbonic acid, interacts with the rocks, mineralizes them, and makes carbonates which go into the ground and, you know, right? So the carbon which gets into the ground through the, human, uh, through the flora and fauna over millions of years gets converted into fossil fuels. Similar phenomenon happens in the oceans the marine life there, as it dies, sinks, that carbon goes in and we get fossil fuels, right? And it keeps, and fossil fuels from the ground get released to volcanoes and other leaks, right? So it keeps changing. Now, at a point in time, when the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the least, it's the coldest, right? At, as carbon dioxide concentration starts building up, it starts getting warmer. When it's at its peak, it's really warm and then it starts reversing back. Now imagine a permutation combination where Earth is at its farthest end, the summers are short, and the carbon dioxide is at its minimum. It really pushes us into the ice age, right? And the reverse is also true. This is how the natural cycles happen. Now the question I'm sure, you know, you would also ask me, uh, Prem, is that if if it's natural, if climatic cycles are natural, then why are we worried? Why are we talking or sitting here, you know, worried? 
The, the issue is this time it's different. And it's, if it's different because the change is on steroids, right? What we humans are doing is pulling out a lot of fossil fuels and by other means, putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, putting additional uh, greenhouse gases, like just to define greenhouse gases, gases like carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitric oxide, and you know some other trace gases. These are all green, called greenhouse gases. Uh, we are really putting them at double speed or multiple speed into the atmosphere. And what they're going and doing is forming a blanket around the Earth. Now, just as in our normal life, in winters we take a blanket, and what a blanket does for us is, it doesn't bring extra heat from outside. It ensures that the body heat does not escape and keeps us warm. So in that f form, this blanket of, uh, you know, the greenhouse gases is doing a similar job. You know, it's keeping us warm. And honestly speaking, in some form, it's very beneficial because if there were no greenhouse gases, the average temperature of the Earth would be minus 18 degrees centigrade, right? Unlivable, right? It's because of greenhouse gases that we enjoy a comfortable 15 degrees. But the challenge is this blanket is getting thicker and warming at a very rapid pace and making us uncomfortable. And how this hap is happening is, see, we get most of our energy the Earth gets most of its energy from the sun. And we get this energy in the form of light energy or sunlight, right? Uh, and let's say there are 100 units of energy we are getting, right? 30 units of that energy actually gets reflected back into space. And that ha happens by way of a simple phenomenon that white surfaces reflect light away, right? So all the glaciers, all the clouds, and all the sand, white sand that you see, helps us in reflecting the light away. And it's only 70% that hits us. Imagine if 100% of sun's energy was hitting us, the world would be a much warmer place. Again, unlivable, right? Now, this 70% uh, units of energy which is coming to uh, the Earth actually helps run the mankind, right? We do our day's work, everything from there. And in the night, right, like every object has to maintain its energy balance. So Earth also maintains its en uh, energy balance. So in the night, whatever additional energy is there is re radiated back by the Earth. And it's radiated back as infrared rays or as thermal energy, right? So remember, when, it, when we received energy, it was light energy, but when we are rad uh, radiating it back, it's thermal energy. Now, these infrared rays, as they are escaping the Earth, gases like oxygen and nitrogen, which form the maximum portion of the atmosphere, allow them these to kind of escape the Earth, uh, you know, transparently. But... Uh, gases, the greenhouse gases, start blocking these infrared rays. And they do that because of the atomic structure. Uh, the electrons around these gases, uh, their wavelength starts matching with the wavelength of the infrared rays. Just like in school physics, you know, our teachers always told us that when there is a column of military or army guys walking over a bridge, marching over a bridge, they're always asked to break their step because otherwise their steps start resonating with the frequency of the bridge and the bridge could collapse. And there have been real life cases like that. So a kind of similar phenomenon is happening, right? Because the wavelength of the infrared rays and the electrons is matching, these get excited, right? Taking the heat and the temperature rises. And this heat is not radiated out, it's reflected back. And that's how this blanket that I spoke about is getting warmer and raising the temperature. This extra energy that is coming in is what is causing havoc and climate change. I hope that gives you an idea.
yeah. a broad overview, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, broadly speaking, summing up what you said, there, there are natural reasons why this happens. Uh, one of it is the uh, movement of the Earth, both around its own axis and also in relation to the Sun. Um, also, the whole thing of the greenhouse gas cover and how that uh, effect. And that's a beautiful analogy, by the way, that of a blanket which traps your own heat. Uh, problem is, if you have two blankets on top of you, you have problems. Yeah. Um, but what occurs to me is a point that you made early on in this uh, dissertation where you said our activities, or you said sure. that we are ramping up, or you used the words on steroids. Now, Almost the entire mass of humankind falls into three broad categories. There is the agriculturist, there is the pastoralist, and there is the industrialist. And industry being used is in a broad sort of sense uh, for all kinds of manufacturing uh, activity. It strikes me that a lot of the issues with excess carbon dioxide in the thing come from these three factors combined. So. Are we at that point saying that, look, what is happening is inevitable? We talk about the fact that if the Earth increases, I mean, the temperature of the Earth increases by 1.5 degree Celsius more, which is expected to do sometime in the next 10 years. You've got your permafrost melting, you've got the polar ice cap melting, you've got the sea level rising to unimaginable levels, which basically means it wipes out pretty much all the coastlines, it wipes out the Polynesian islands. In fact. Kiribati, I think, is already... That's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, people are migrating out, and, and yeah. Rajan did make the point about environmental migration. This is not a prognosis. It's something that's actually happening right now. So you have all of that, and are we then saying that what we are facing is inevitable? If you're saying that a large contribution is from activities that we can't do without, we can't do without agriculture. We certainly can't do without the pastoralist. And we certainly can't do without, let's say, using a broad term, industry or development or whatever you want to call it. So are we on an inevitable death cycle? If we do nothing and take life as usual and go on, I think we are on an inevitable, we are doomed, right? But I think human ingenuity will ensure we don't go that way, right? Uh, there have been many incidences earlier also where, you know, it almost seemed that the world is going to come to an end, or, but um, I think the alarm bells that rang made, you know, our scientists, our engineers, our entrepreneurs, and every one of us kind of take it as a challenge and address that and we solve those problems. And I'm sure this time also we will do that. Uh, to, if I can, because you touched on the three categories and spoke about, you know, the inevitable, uh, is it okay if I kind of elaborate on them and uh, tell you what, what all is happening? Because uh, there is a lot happening to kind of uh, uh, control this crisis as well. And I, I think it's our job to talk about it as well and to work towards that uh, if we were to really uh, save our planet, right? And you, you kind of summed it up very well. See, it's important to understand the sources of the problem because only then you can find the solutions, right? Uh, we just spoke about, and all of you are aware, the problem really is the greenhouse gases, right? From whatever source they come, right? Uh, and therefore, we need to kind of control greenhouse gases if we want a solution. There are three main sources of greenhouse gases. The first and foremost is fossil fuels, which contributes approximately 70% of the greenhouse gases. The second is industry, which contributes another 20% or so. And the third is agriculture and land use, which contributes another 10%, right? Let's take a deeper look at you know, uh, how they are contributing and uh, what, what changes are being brought in, right? Uh, if you look at fossil fuels, uh, 
the majority of their use is in electricity generation, right? 70% uh, of the electricity we use worldwide comes from fossil fuels, right? 36 billion tons of carbon dioxide is being spewed by these power plants every year into the atmosphere. Now, if you say that tomorrow, right, to save the planet, let's put all the lights off, the electricity, that ain't gonna happen, right? Uh, we won't let it happen, right? So the world has started working on it. Uh, that's how you see the transition to renewable energy, right, to solar power, or to wind power, and many other forms of electricity are being looked at. Now, there are challenges in it because the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So the supply and demand are not matching, and therefore you need to come up with storage solutions, right? And there is work being done on that. Slow, but at least it's, it's started. However, I want to add here that even if we kind of shift to renewables like solar and wind, I don't think the climate problem is going to be solved so easily, right? Because where is the land for that? And these kind of new technologies are bringing their own set of problems with them, right? Because the waste going to, that's going to be generated is going to be difficult to handle and creates its own carbon footprint. Nuclear is also waiting there. It was a, a source of power we were using. Unfortunately, after the Fukushima thing, it's gone into a winter. But I must add here that there are some people who silently but surely have been working on nuclear. Bill Gates is one of them. He's been funding a lot of nuclear research. Uh, and there are technologies now which have made, which at least are said to have made it safer and cheaper, which were the two issues, right? Uh, I won't go into the details here, but I do want to mention this, that so far we were using nuclear fission as the base for nuclear power, right? And that had the problems because it would get into a chain reaction. Well, that's being worked upon. There's a new kid on the block, nuclear fusion, which is how the sun produces its energy. That's through nuclear fusion. So what they're trying to do is replicate the same here. And in nuclear fission, you would break the item and that would release energy. In nuclear fission, you bring two atoms together and they release energy. And the world's been working on that for a long time. And it was only two years back at the uh, Livermore Berkeley Institute they did a positive test, which means that the amount of energy that was released by bringing two atoms together was actually more than the energy that was used to fuse them together. So that's a very positive development. And I think considering the way our energy needs are increasing, you know, because our lifestyles are becoming so comfortable, right? AI uses huge amount of energy. Many other technologies use huge amount of energy. So to cater to all that, you need an endless, bottomless source of energy. And probably nuclear fusion could be one of them, and there is work happening on that. The other major contributor in the fossil fuels for uh, you know, the greenhouse gases is transportation, right? cars, ships, planes. And you would have heard about the, you know, the transition that's happening there with EVs coming in to replace the commercial and passenger ground vehicles. They're talking about uh, green hydrogen for ships and sustainable fuel for aviation. Uh, so early stages, but I think the, the journey has started. And all of us, us need to participate in these programs. You know, next time we have to, we think about a car, think EV first. It, it would certainly help. The second is category is industry. And just to give you an idea, uh, cement alone contributes around 6% carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Steel, another 5 to 6%. Now, 
industry gives out or emits greenhouse gases in two ways. One is by the energy it uses, the electricity it uses, or the fossil fuels it uses just for heating because the reactions need heat, right? Huge amount of emissions are there. The other important and really high volume uh, issue is also the chemical reactions that happen. For example, for cement, you have to convert limestone to lime, and you do it by heating limestone. As, and as you heat limestone, carbon dioxide gets emitted. Today, the world is emitting approximately 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide from cement alone every year. Now, work has started on that. Uh, first thing, if the er energy we are able to shift to renewables, uh, then that takes, gets taken care of. And uh, for the chemical reactions, uh, they're working on electrochemistry and bringing in green hydrogen to see that the transition happens smoothly. But it won't happen until we as consumers demand, you know, green cement and green steel, industry starts producing it, and the policy framework encourages use and production of that, right? So all three need to fall in line for the change really to happen. I'm gonna take two more minutes, right? Take the last minutes. one is the most important, which is agriculture and land use. Because all of us tend to think that something as natural as agriculture and land, how could that be a culprit in this whole, whole thing? The world was earlier forested. There was natural uh, you know, growth, flora and fauna everywhere. And it acted as a natural carbon sink, right? Because of photosynthesis, it would, during the day, breathe in uh, carbon dioxide uh, and give out oxygen, right? Uh, help th keeping things in balance. Because, and then come agriculture, we had to clear the forests, right? And we did that by two ways, either by burning them or by cutting them. Either way, uh, carbon dioxide got emitted, right? And added to the atmosphere and started kind of creating uh, warming there. The second thing we do in agriculture is we till the land. And each time we till the land, the land stores a lot of air and carbon dioxide that gets out and gets into the atmosphere, right? Uh, also, the fertilizer that we put in has a lot of nitrogen, right? And when we till, that nitrogen comes out again, reacts with oxygen, gets converted into nitric oxide and up. And nitric oxide is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, right? And then we, when we are growing crops, for rice, for example, we flood the fields. The moment we flood the fields, the microbes, there are certain microbes underneath, uh, they go undergo anaerobic fermentation and release methane. Methane is around 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. All this is adding uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and think, thickening that blanket that we spoke about. Now, even after the crops are harvested, worldwide, 30% of the food is wasted right from the time it's harvested to transportation to retail and finally on our dining table. And wasted food means it gets decomposed and decomposition means greenhouse gases are going up in the atmosphere, right? So this is how agriculture contributes. Uh, the, big, the big guys, however, are the livestock, right? And the world today has approximately two billion cattle or livestock spread all over. Majority of them, or a lot of them in India, uh, and India is doubly uh, kind of impacted because they live much longer here, yeah. right? Now what happens is, unlike we human beings, uh, livestock has multiple stomachs, right? Uh, and in the first two stomachs, they are first, or first two, depending upon what category we are talking about, uh, they undergo anaerobic fermentation to break down the complex sugars that they take into simpler sugars. 
And this fermentation again gives out methane. And that's how you see them belching with that foam and a lot of methane is given out, right? And that kind of is really spoiling the, uh, your, or adding to the greenhouse gases, right? I also want to touch another point that, you know, if I was to add one kg of weight, uh, and let's say I have to have 10 kgs of food for that, right? For a similar addition of one kg weight for a cattle, they need to consume eight times the food, that is 80 kgs of food. And where is this food coming from? It's not all through grazing. It's being grown. The forests are being cleared for that. 17% of Amazon has been cleared in the last 25 years just for cattle feed, right? And imagine the destruction it's doing, right? Uh, again, the livestock also adds methane because of uh, their manure as it decomposes, methane is added. Now, what are we doing about it, right? Uh, is it, you know, world over, as prosperity rises, more and more our people are kind of jumping onto the, uh, getting their proteins from uh, animal sources, right? So we need to control that. So, you know, some movements must have started for uh, vegetarian food, but the industry is also working towards plant-based meat, right? There have been commercial launches, some successes, some failures, but I think the amount of work that is going on is one day we will crack it, right? Same way, uh, there, there's probiotic feed, just like we take uh, curds and we take Yakult, uh, you know, to help our digestive system. Uh, there are probiotic foods being developed for the cattle. Uh, to reduce their methane uh, uh, emissions. So good work happening very slow right now. It needs money, it needs our uh, embracing of these solutions to make a change. So these are the three categories, you know, from where the greenhouse gases are coming and some work that is happening. Just to give you an idea, there's more in the book if you read. Yeah, and we'll get back to the money part in a bit, but I, I was just wondering, any Gaurakshas in the audience? <laughs> okay, because, I mean, one way of explaining the interconnectedness of things in the world is that old saying about a butterfly that flaps its wings in the Amazon and uh, starts a storm uh, somewhere off the Indian coast. Today it is a cow passing wind in India causing typhoons over there. But, you know, you touched on the three major, let's say, axes of uh, carbon emission. I still wanted to stay with the interconnectedness and to a point that you uh, have raised in your book, which is a lot of activities that we don't immediately, and, and all of this is to drive home the point that when we think climate change, we seem to bucket it into a few things. Now we started bucketing it into carbon dioxide is being released there for climate change. Take it a step further. For instance, how does the war in Ukraine or the uh, war between Israel, it's not a war, but whatever, uh, the, the, the genocide in Gaza, how does that impact climate change? And the reason I ask you that is because you made the point about if we want to solve a problem, we've got to understand the problem. And one way of understanding that problem is looking at world events in our own backyard or halfway around the world and connecting it up or seeing if there are connections, right? So how does war, for instance? Sure, yeah. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, military operations contribute around 5.5% of global greenhouse gases. And that's not just war, it's the, the exercises or the preparation for war that uh, is responsible for it. The fire and fury that you see during the war is responsible for it. And most importantly, the rebuild that is required after the war is responsible for it, right? So all these activities do emit carbon dioxide. I, I just want to kind of re-emphasize this point that there are only 
two things that cause or that are within our control uh, to some extent to help avoid this crisis. One is, uh, you know, they say the ends justify the means. So the end is greenhouse gases. As long as we can control greenhouse gases, we'll be fine. Or control means, uh, I'm, I'm wrong in saying we'll be fine because there's, so, there's too much of it already in the atmosphere. We need to even reduce what is there in the atmosphere. The second thing is if we can increase the albedo effect. Albedo effect is the, the, what I spoke about earlier, that white surfaces reflect light away. If the white surfaces can be increased, right, then more of the light energy will get reflected back and therefore we will absorb less energy and there'll be less global warming. These are the only two things I think within our means that we can do, right? Um, and to, to come back to your question of war, right? Uh, you know, I, I spoke about it a little bit in our book uh, I don't want to rant about it here, but I, I just will touch upon it uh, very briefly. That any kind of war will always contribute greenhouse gases because of the three things. You will prepare for it, you will indulge in it, and then you will rebuild, right? All these activities will, will entail greenhouse gases. Now, if you, so the issue is to avoid war, right? Now, how do you do that, right? In a family, when two siblings fight, the elders step in and, you know, they would kind of take a decision, punish one of them, and, you know, it gets resolved. Similarly, in a nation, we have a judiciary or a judicial system. You go to a court with a dispute, they will put some fine on you, they will give a judgment, and as law-abiding citizens, you honor that, and the dispute gets resolved. Even in the International arena, uh, there are these bodies, right? There's the World Trade Organization for trade disputes. There's the International Sea uh, something for ocean, uh, maritime, this thing, right? And we also have the trinity of the UN system, uh, the Secretary General as the voice of reason, the, secure, uh, the International Court of Justice as the adjudicator, and then the Security Council as the big daddy to, uh, you know, impose and bring, make sure that, uh, you know, the, the decision is kind of followed. But somehow it's not working, you know. Uh, the UN system doesn't seem to be working, right? So we need to see either how we strengthen that or come up with an alternate body which is free of fear and favor, right? And that body also needs to be given some tools, right? So one of the tools that I've written about briefly in the book as well as, should there be a war, uh, tax on war, right? Because if you really see, nature was created equal for everyone. So nobody has the right to spoil nature that can adversely affect anybody else, right? Your neighbors, your, you know, your other country, whatever. So the proposal was that, uh, you know, Anybody getting into a war, you tax them. And you can tax them in different ways. You either tax uh, people producing armaments, right? You tax the countries buying them, or you tax people getting into a war. And this pool of money goes into a fund, uh, which helps mitigate the greenhouse gases, you know, uh, you know, use this money for transitioning to renewable energy or clean sources of energy, use this fund for adaptation because a lot of people are suffering because of climate change. So, you know, whatever means you, you, you would like to use it for. Yeah. Does that answer your question? It does and gives me the next question, uh, which is broadly speaking, sometime back we talked about identifying a problem um, COVID, okay, it's a virus. Uh, as looking through, you know, and I have been following COP and the various other uh, climate conferences, 
it reminds me of one of these old Sergio Leone westerns where at the end everybody's got a pistol pointed at everybody else, uh, all standing in a circle with a gun to thing. So when you ask who's responsible for this, somebody says it is the UK because of the Industrial Revolution, somebody says it's the US when it, uh, post World War II, when it embarked on that massive uh, regeneration process. Uh, you make the point that if you look at the uh, if you look at it through the lens of who is currently producing the most amount of greenhouse gases, the finger points at China and India. If you're looking at who is per GDP, who is most responsible, the finger points somewhere else. If you look at per capita, then the finger points to fourth party. Now, it strikes me that either we have to say that we are collectively responsible without parsing it and saying who was responsible at which particular point in time, or we can just do this little dance for the rest. The reason why I wanted to ask you about that is because we are stuck in this who is responsible and therefore the money is not getting to the table because everybody is saying, why am I paying for it? UK says industrial revolution happened like decades ago. What have I got to do with this? Why am I putting money on the table? So how do we, how do we stop this Mulberry Bush dance and get down to brass tacks? I think that's a very good question, very pertinent, uh, Prem. The reason, and I, I'll link it to what I said earlier, it's 32 years since the UNFCC or the treaty was signed and we haven't been able to solve the issue. 32 years is a long period otherwise. And the sole reason for that is what you just pointed out. We are not able to fix the responsibility, right? Because it's a complex issue. Let me pause you there. At this point in time, when you're facing a collective disaster, do we even need to spend time fixing the disaster? I mean, fixing the responsibility. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I think the, the Paris Agreement has solved that to some extent. And let me explain how. Because, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a historical perspective, that initially, and rightly so, everybody came to this conclusion that the developed world has caused this problem, therefore they are responsible and they should pay for it, right? And the Kyoto Protocol was signed, but it was a dead horse, right? It never really delivered anything. The world soon realized that nothing is happening and junked it, and that's how they started working on the Paris Agreement. The whole idea of Paris Agreement was this collective thing that this is a global issue, right? And it's a stock and flow problem, right? The climate change has been caused by whatever gas, greenhouse gases are there, and it's getting aggravated by the additional gas, uh, greenhouse gases that we are adding everywhere. So very deftly, the negotiators or the creators of the Paris Agreement came up with a, with a term or a clause called common but differentiated responsibilities, right? The basic premise of that was that whoever has caused the problem, we understand, but we have a common goal now. We need to save this planet. So therefore, all of us need to march in the same direction. And it said, we also understand that not everyone has the same capability or resources to contribute equally towards that goal. Therefore, they said to the nations that were participating, and almost all nations participated, that you voluntarily tell us, right, what can you contribute? This is our goal. We don't want to exceed this limit of uh, emissions, mm -hmm. so please tell us. And this was called the nationally determined contribution. So all the nations, the, the well-meaning ones, and the not so well-meaning ones went back to their drawing boards, right? And started working out what they could contribute. And then came back and during the COPs started kind of committing that, right? Uh, so to some extent, you know, they're all kind of 
at least agreed to march in the same direction. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that being voluntary, there's no legal, it has no legal binding, right? right? So a lot of people call the Paris Agreement as weak need, and it is weak need. And right? it's also not just unenforceable, but also unmonitorable, right, to an extent. It is unmonitorable, you're right, to some extent, but you see, it's left to countries' own discretion, honesty, judgment, to come up with what they are doing and how much have they saved, and every five years they do a stock take, right? But something good has happened and should always happen is the civil society needs to step up, right? Because, and they, to some extent they are, there are a few foundations worldwide which have now started tracking the commitments that countries are making. And you can go through their website and see, and they're ruthless, right? Uh, so I think that needs to happen. Plus the responsibility lies with all of us. If our country has gone and committed that this is what they're gonna do for climate, uh, at, at they've committed at the COP, and then they're not doing it, then we need to hold their feet to fire, you know? and you know, make it a election issue, make it a voting issue, whatever, or raise our voices, because otherwise we will be the sufferers, right? So I think that part is happening. There is still a lot of greenwashing, right? People are still kind of pointing fingers, and there is this di dichotomy you see between the developed and the developing world still. And there is some justice to it, Right? We all know the problem was created by the developed world, and we, we are the kind of sufferers, right? It's a double whammy for the developing world, right? And I'll explain why. If you look at any country's, developing country's budget, India included, some portion of our, the government's revenue comes from fossil fuels and a reasonable portion of it, in case of India, it's 18% of revenue, comes by way of customs duty that the government charges on import of oil, it comes by way of local taxes on coal and other fossil fuels, it comes by way of royalties that the government gets from these uh, fossil fuel companies, the CES and other things. Yeah, Indian Railways is already in trouble and- Yeah, absolutely. A large part of its revenue comes from transporting absolutely. coal. Absolutely. Now, if the government was to give up fossil fuels, 18% of the revenue just evaporates. And in a country or in a world, I'll take the example of India, where only 1% of our GDP goes into health. I'm not sure about the figures, correct me if I'm wrong, oh, and 2.6% into education. If 18% of our revenue goes, these will further suffer, right? Our investments in the sectors where we need growth. So it's a difficult decision for the governments to take. And it's not only that. On the other hand, we are supposed to now transition our infrastructure to a clean infrastructure, which means a lot of investments. So on one hand, developing countries are losing revenue. On the other hand, they have to invest, but they don't have the money. So where does this money come from? That's how we are kind of knocking, you know, and kind of telling the developed world, if you want change, please put in the money because, you know, we will suffer if, you know, but you will also suffer, right? And there are solutions being kind of worked upon. There's one I've spoken in the book, cause, so I, I don't want to kind of uh, go, yeah, I mean, unless book, you want people. me to. Sorry, shall I talk about that? No, no, I said read the book. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So, yeah, that's, that's uh, what I would... Uh... Yeah. You know, um, it's only on my way here that I realized it's a Friday, the start of a long weekend. Um, it's a Saturday? Yeah, it's a Saturday. It is the middle of a long weekend, and I expected five people to be here. Uh, the place is full up, which basically means a lot of people interested in this. I could go on asking questions because I wanted to ask you about say, for instance, collective versus individual responsibility. I want to ask you about, um, you know, 
have you seen examples around the world where people are actually thinking? Uh, Kiribati is an example. For instance, migration has already started. They're planning yeah. for that and they're actually working on it. But other examples where localized solutions are being found which are applicable elsewhere. Lots of these questions, but I think in all fairness, the audience will probably have a lot of questions. Sure. So if we can turn it over to them for a minute. Sure, delighted to People take with any questions, questions, raise your hand. Yeah, uh, my name is Saibal. Um, I actually have quite a few questions. Sure. Um, stop me when you think it's enough. So one is, um, first question is, uh, I think, uh, you know, there are some low-hanging fruits, you know. For example, you know, a plane circles before landing for 30 minutes. You know, there's a lot of uh, greenhouse gases going up. All this road congestion that we see, and we don't turn off the engine, uh, so I think efficiency, if it can come in, you know, this is a, what I call a low-hanging fruit. Probably it will, you know, reduce this problem to a great extent, number one. Number two is uh, uh, <coughs> I was wondering if there are any punitive measures any country has put in place uh, for, uh, you know, uh, towards climate change and uh, or rather lack of it. Uh, number three is, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you was, uh, yeah, I think part of this low-hanging fruit also has to do a lot, lot to do with, uh, you know, education and awareness. Now, for example, you know, if I go out of this room, I switch off the light, you know, in general, sustainability. We don't waste water or we don't some of us have these lavish weddings, which we keep on hearing about. Now, uh, so is enough being done about these? Because, you know, these are, I think, easy steps which can uh, do a lot of mitigation. So I wanted you to dwell a bit on that. Uh, what is really happening on that front, which is very easy to do? Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll try and answer those. Um, so there is a chapter in the book on low-hanging fruits, right? Uh, I haven't touched on some of the ones you mentioned, but there are others where you can make systemic changes and you know take benefit of those low-hanging fruits, right? But what you mentioned is very important. The challenge is, you know, uh, is about awareness, education, awareness, right? Uh, I'd read somewhere long back that, you know, there were fishermen in some village who were going out to fish even in rough waters. And the government started a program of kind of announcing to them that it's going to be bad sea, so therefore don't go. But they still used to go and lose their lives sometimes. And when they asked, you know, uh, them, why do you still take that risk? The answer was living is more important than life, right? For a lot of people, climate is not even a consideration. You know, I think it's 0.001% of people who would even think about it, right? So to bring around change, it needs a large-scale transformation, large-scale change. Individual efforts must go in. There's nothing can happen without that but we also need systemic changes and transformative changes which can happen through policy framework, through, uh, you know, uh, industrial, uh, this thing. Uh, for example, cement, right? Rather than we convincing people to use less cement, which they must, right? If the cement industry adopts technologies which can create uh, emissionless cement. That's a better, this thing. So we have to kind of pedal on both of these to bring around uh, a change. Uh, Rajan, and I'll take a little bit of the audience sure. time to just expand that question sure. a little bit. Is it then possible, you brought, I mean, you brought up the subject of cement at the end. Is it then possible to mm. have a system where Industries, companies, etc., that are actually helping mitigate these uh, issues, 
are being rewarded and at the same time industries that are contributing to the problem are being punished by way of extra taxes or money that they have to pay uh, damages or whatever. Will that work? I think that's a beautiful question. Uh, see, the whole issue, and the world has been debating on that, is should there be a carbon tax, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, emissions are a negative ex externality, which means that people who are polluting, uh, they are affecting the welfare and health of bystanders like us who are doing nothing yet they don't have to pay for it. So there's this whole concept of Peguvian taxes where if the market fails to price these things into the product, then the government must step in to tax so that the supply and demand is matched, really. So world over, carbon tax is being spoken about so that anybody polluting there is a tax on carbon. And then economists believe that the supply and demand will take care of it. Uh, I don't know of any country other than the, some of the Nordic countries which have implemented it in some form of fashion, yeah. is toying with it. Sweden has kind of in some form of fashion. But some other European countries have gone in for a cap and trade, you know, where uh, they are giving a quota to the industry uh, on their limit for emissions. Uh, if you save on that, you can trade those, the, sure. whatever saving you made on the exchange and earn money. And if you're not, you exceed that quota, then you have to buy from the people who are saving to, and that's some form of a market, this thing, which will take care of it. Europe has done it. It's not, it's not working 100%. And I think Europe has now getting, is getting serious. They're trying to see how it can be kind of, you know, put some wind behind it. So again, all these are experiments and politicians are very, very loath to take these decisions. Because the moment you do that, you know, it will result, it will be inflationary for some time. And therefore, it affects their vote bank, right? Also, you know, budgets will have to be shifted and all. So a lot of talk about carbon tax, but few people are doing it. But I think the writing is on the wall. Europe has announced the uh, carbon border, border management, this thing, which means that, you know, uh, any product which has a carbon footprint above what they've specified will have to pay a tax there. And that money goes into European pockets, not ours. So we'll be better off if we invest today and make sure the carbon footprint is brought to the neutral level. So yes, things like that uh, kind of uh, are, are happening, not to a, to a large extent. But <laughs> yes. uh, so uh, good, uh, related things, I mean, one is there is a lot of also a lot of vested interest, right? Especially in developed countries, right? Which uh, kind of are trying to either deny or whatever. Uh, uh, still work against right some of these mitigation strategies and so on. And as individuals, I feel a lot of it is really down to lack of awareness. Uh, and here again, I feel the richer people amongst us, right? We are the ones contributing much more through our lifestyles than some of the poorer people. How do we at least amongst individuals bring that sense of responsibility or perhaps that sense of shame uh, I mean, just like uh, kind of there have been Holocaust deniers as well, right? But now, I mean, the rest of the world puts them to shame when they when they do such things. Uh, how do we make sure that again, I mean, all of these vested interests which try to deny that climate change is happening and so on, right, are likewise put to shame. And similarly, right, the people who drive all these, I mean, there's a, we look at all these SUVs and so on, right, as status symbols. I mean, they should become, I mean, people should be ashamed of driving such vehicles. Uh, how do we instill that sense of sure. responsibility? Um, it's a tough question. <laughs> I'll try to answer. Um, you know, the debate, at least in the international circuits, on whether climate change is real or not, I think scientifically, at least now it's settled that climate change is real. We humans are the cause of it. The aberration that came in between was Trump, right? 
he could come again right uh, I, not just trump because i was thinking of another prime minister somewhere who said we are just losing our tolerance to heat <laughs> that was closer home <laughs> yeah but i think in the scientific community and community the people who are the thinkers behind some of these people at least i think they are convinced now that it's real it's happening the debate now even in that circle is whether nature will take care of it or not and some are still pushing that no 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 it is happening we understand that we are convinced but nature will take care of it but nature also has limits so leaving that aside see the first step towards change is really awareness right and honestly the whole purpose of this book that i wrote was to bring climate discussion center stage and the book is written in a manner that you can, it becomes a dining table discussion right leave aside the book it's upon all of us to start talking about it to our family to our friends to our colleagues the awareness needs to spread the moment awareness spread this you know putting people to shame will automatically follow right but really and we must do that i'm not saying that we must not do that but imagine in the grand scheme of things how many people people could be shameless right how many people would you put to shame how many of them will get the cue that they are being put to shame how many of them will actually change right uh, and i'm not trying to say for a minute we should not do that we should definitely do that but we need to think far beyond that at the systemic level right on how to bring around that change and as we as people you know we are powerful right we have our votes and we have our wallets right if we use them effectively i think change will be much faster and stronger because if we let people our politicians know we care for it and next time we are going to make this an issue for elections right and make sure this spreads because we should not be content with getting 5 kgs of rice right we want a future right if you make it an issue i think you will see change happening because big changes require you know transformative changes require policy intervention right same thing uh with our wallets right if we start you know using our money for products like today to be honest uh many of us would not pay 5 rupees extra for that extra you know a uh, packet of, or you know sack of cement cement if it was green cement right that change we need to bring in ourselves that spend it's for our future right the moment we start spending on that economies of scale come in the entrepreneurs or the industrialists get encouraged they will transform right so i think i would bet on these two tools in our hands right now i'll add yeah. one more to the mix uh and it's just a thought i'll throw out there for everybody how engaged are we with things that are not happening on our doorstep so to give you an example there's a nicobar project what they're basically doing is a state sized area completely cleared of trees in the name of some they want to build a port they want to build tourist facilities etc etc it's on page 10 of the newspaper half the people don't read it the other half don't care because it's we can't see the connection but you lose that many trees like rajan pointed out when he was talking you're saying you'll replace it where you're going to replace it you don't know you can't take a microclimate and put it somewhere else logically secondly you don't have the land thirdly the trees you're planting are not the sort of trees that will help mitigate whatever damage you've done over here do we care no the hasdio mine uh, for instance the locals are protesting who's raising their voice against it outside of that locality nobody so maybe start getting engaged with larger issues would probably help 
Yeah, hi. Uh, I just uh, wanted to contribute to the carbon trading discussion that we were having. Uh, I'm Megha, I'm a lawyer with uh, JSA. Um, so I'll speak to you offline, uh, you know, such as a uh, colleague. So um, India has, in fact, uh, recently amended the Energy Conservation Act and introduced carbon trading, and we are moving from the PAT scheme to the, you know, the uh, cap and trade scheme. But I think it will take a while for us to adopt what EU has already adopted, and there are a lot of learnings from the EU, uh, you know, cap and trade scheme, and also the effect that CBAM would have uh, in India. And how we can, I mean, any thoughts around how we can, uh, you know, mitigate the effects of CBAM? Um, honestly, I don't. But uh, I think the best way for us would be to adopt our industry accordingly. Because it's not a one-time issue, right? Uh, see, uh, one is commercially how we do that, right? But I want to take the discussion a little away. Uh, you know, God forbid, if some disaster strikes, it should not strike anywhere in the world, right? I really pray for it. But if it strikes, and it strikes in the developed world, they will have the technology, they'll have the money, they'll have the systems to take care of it. If it strikes in the developing world, we will have none of them. And therefore, the loss and damage we will suffer would be multitudes of what they would suffer. Therefore, the best tool in our hand is to make sure that we don't, you know, we control this menace, right? Uh, don't let too many greenhouse gases uh, go into the atmosphere because nature should be our best rescuer. And for that, you know, we must toe the line or whatever we can do. So if it's CBAM, then we must make sure that you know our products are carbon this thing. Not only from a nature's point of view, it will also make us world competitive. Because if not today, tomorrow, other countries, you know, there's the, uh, Germany is talking about the carbon club, you know, many other countries. CBAM has just opened the gate. You will see most of the many countries, developed countries kind of doing the same thing. Because now they've figured out this is a good lever to bring around a change, right? And therefore, change we must. It will be on, in our benefit, right? Uh, otherwise, our industries will get killed. You know, we need to grow uh, our industry, you know. And we should use this, in fact, CBAM, even to go a step further. We should become the first ones to, you know, uh, if investments are required, government needs to give subsidy, whatever, I'm, I'm not getting into the financial part, but we right. must, because that will carve a position for ourselves in the world, even to increase us exports or trade further. Does that answer your question somewhat? Again, you know, I'm not an expert uh, in, in carbon trading, uh, but just a little bit on, so there are two uh, kind of uh, big blocks for carbon trading. One is, of course, the compliance, and the other one is the voluntary markets. Uh, it hasn't come out in the compliance uh, markets as much as it has come out in the voluntary markets, that there is greenwashing happening there. There's a lot of fraud that is happening there. So these things need to be regulated, right? And they need to be regulated with seriousness, right? Uh, on the voluntary side, I think, I think one of the big dampeners has been the pricing, right? because the pricing is so low that there's not enough motivation to go in for these carbon projects. Uh, I won't risk myself to talk more because I don't really know very much deeply about it uh, more than this. Yeah. Sorry for that, yeah. Yes, please. Hi. Um, you've raised or touched upon awareness and also that kind of indirectly 
also looks into behavioral changes which we need to do. I wanted you to talk about what about the mafia or the people who are stopping it. One is the people who want to do it and who are working towards it. But there's an equally or even more stronger force. You, For example, you mentioned the Amazon. There was a beautiful, a very hard-hitting documentary on the livestock, uh, which was within a week removed from Netflix because of the ripple effect it was creating um, <clears throat> amongst people to stop doing the right things they had to do for it. You see, mafia will always be there, right? Uh, and again, it's upon us and the, the governors, you know, uh, to, to make sure or to manage them. We can manage them or, or reduce their appetite by making sure we are not consuming the products, right? If it's, if it's let's say, the, in the Amazon, uh, it's, I would guess it's primarily for uh, forest clearing, right? Uh, and they're clearing it because of animal feed, right? Because the demand for animal feed, uh, you know, the, ca uh, the uh, uh, protein from animals or meat is so high, growing so fast that they are lured to invest in that, right? If the demand comes down, automatically, you know, uh, they go out of business. So one is in our hands where what I spoke about, the wallet matters. The other is, you know, the governments need to get serious about it and they will get serious if they understand that they for, this is an issue for their voters. So two things I want to, you to take away from this discussion are the power in your hands of votes and wallets. It may be slow, but it'll be sure. No. Sorry, does that answer you to some extent? I, I don't have any you know, real quick fix uh, yeah. solutions for it. Uh, Hi, yes. uh, Rajan, thanks a lot. Uh, fabulous book and such an inspiring talk today as well. Um, slightly provocative thought, uh, you know, we are uh, sitting in India and uh, you uh, briefly mentioned a few minutes back that uh, India is one of, going to be one of the countries which bears the brunt of uh, climate change. So uh, what's stopping us from talking a lot more about adaptation? Uh, it almost feels like uh, answers are not known. And uh, you know. Uh sure. Uh, you know, there is one thing is there's this whole debate going on between mitigation and adaptation. And I'll come to your point uh, in a minute. The developed world is focused on mitigation. The developing world is focused on adaptation. The developed world is focused on mitigation because they have the means, if a disaster strikes, to manage it. So therefore, they want to nip the evil in the bud and make sure that you know, they're not creating the probability of that happening. Right? Whereas in the developed world, it's a here and now issue, right? If something happens, our people suffer, and we don't want that suffering to happen. Therefore, we are calling for uh, measures towards adaptation. Uh, the money is with the West, which they, whatever little they give, they do, uh, you know, do it for mitigation. They haven't opened their strengths for adaptation. So adaptation is lacking funds, first thing. The second is, you know, till the baby cries, nobody feeds, right? I think that's the real issue. You know, adaptation, they think, yeah, it won't happen to us, it'll happen somewhere else. Uh, I think that attitude is kind of keeping investments and effort uh, for things to happen uh, uh, for adaptation. I hope so. I don't have to write it because I hope change happens so quickly that it becomes an issue of irrelevance. You know, that's that's the real hope. Yeah. Hi. So yeah. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. So I don't know if you have a solution to a common man's problem is the mineral water bottle. 
what is the solution for that? I mean, at 20 rupees a liter, any Tom, Dick and Harry, any a worker working at the site also can buy. And then water is one thing, but then that disposing of that plastic bottle is a big, big uh, nuisance, right? So, I mean, do we have a solution for that? I mean, sure. I'm just thinking. Yeah. No, thanks. That's a, that's a very pertinent point. I think the best solution is we carry our own water bottles so that we don't have to throw them away. And you'll see in many colleges, campuses, you know, especially overseas, uh, people carry their own water bottle made of whatever, you know, material. So I think we should all do that and reduce the dependence. But nobody bothers. Even yeah. I sometimes would want to, but okay, it's I've forgotten. Fine, I'll just buy one bottle. No, I think you have right, a so very pertinent point. Again, the issue is we have to solve it at a systemic level, right? Now, plastic bottles, you know, are they can be recycled, right? Now, for recycling you need to first kind of collect them, isolate them, and then recycle them properly. The problem is with us, again, we don't segregate our waste, right? We throw it anywhere, right? If these are collected properly, sent to recycling plants, and they are recycled properly, plastic can be used and reused over and over so that you don't, you know, uh, it doesn't kind of, we are not drawing on further resources to kind of keep polluting the place. Right, And regulations in this will help. If the government makes it mandatory for bottle manufacturers, right, that they have to use X percentage of recycled plastic, they will be bound to. Right? The other thing that is happening internationally, and they've actually introduced that concept or policy in India, it's called the ERP, the Extended Producer Responsibility, that whoever is producing plastic bottles or other stuff is also responsible for collecting it back. Right? So manufacturers who are selling you know, through retail stores, uh, there is a policy now that they have to collect it back and send it for recycling. But like many other things, it's a policy in, on paper, not really fully implemented. bit, which is probably not uh, very enforceable, at least in this state, if you build in the cost of the product at conception. I think that is what will deter someone from picking it up. Because sure. if a bottle costs 700 rupees, which is actually the final cost of what it takes from inception to when it goes back, I think people will be a lot more mindful. And we do speak with our wallets across the world as well, because that's a collective decision they're going to take, rather than punitive. Yeah. So, you. you know, if you ask an economist, he will lap up your solution, because for them, price adjusts the market. But a lot of people may go thirsty, right? You don't want that to happen as well at 700 rupees. So therefore, you've got to look at solutions, because we all want a good life. We deserve a good life. So going without water may not be uh, contributing well, to that. It's just subsidizing yeah, for yeah. A product that is not going to be Absolutely, a carbon tax will Absolutely. solve that issue, and we really need to look at alternate solutions as well. Because you know, the life and the things that we are used to, it's idealistic for us to think we will give up. It's a tough thing to if you tell somebody to give up their car and you know, start going, walking to office, they will not. So we got to see how we make cars which are not polluting, you know, which are not contributing to the ills, whether of climate change or any other, right? That would be the ideal way, I think, you know, uh, to give a better life to everyone. And better is relative to, com you know, because once you get used to something, when it's taken away, it's very hard. Yes. Yeah. Are you, are you asking me? No, no, no. Yeah. 
I'd like to thank uh, Raj Rajan Mehta and Prem Panik uh, Panikar for bringing today's session to BIC. Thank you to the audience for spending your evening with us. You can buy copies of the Backstage Climate outside where the author signing will also take place. If you'd like to know uh, more about future BIC events, there's a QR code to our WhatsApp community that you can scan outside. Good night. Thank you.